Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Well, we uh, definitely had a snowy uh, day here in the Pacific Northwest, but um, like I say every time, we got a good one for you today. I got Todd here. Um, he's been guiding for a handful of years. Saw him on Instagram. Um, there's just sometimes you can tell that somebody has a good presence about themselves, and I've uh, heard how he's handled his guests, wanted to get him on, connect with them, talk steelhead, and, and uh, without further ado, I'll let um, Todd do the talking. Todd, how are you? Great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for making the time like we were talking earlier. I know you're busy, you're a guide, and been looking at your Instagram. You've been uh, on quite the roll, man. Some nice uh, steelhead there you guys have been catching. Yeah, you know, it's um, we're typically on the water roughly about five days a week. So, you know, if you keep your fly in the water long enough, you're eventually going to find those crummers. But uh, uh, when the weather cooperates with us, we get some water in the rivers. They warm up a little bit. Those fish move in. And and fortunately enough, we've been in the right places at the right time. So feel, I feel good about that anyway. That's good. How long have you been guiding for? Well, I I guided in, in my younger years, my te late teens and early 20s till I got out of college. And then I had uh, an insurance career that spanned about uh, 25 years. Mm. And the reason I, I chose that industry was to allow myself some flexibility in my time that I could continue to do the things I really wanted to do, like fishing, hunting, coaching my kids um, and that that industry I was on the on, in the sales portion of it that actually allowed me that flexibility so uh, formally guiding in my teens and early 20s and then uh, the next 25 years I was doing it with friends and family and um, prospective business clients I would take them fishing um, and then about uh, 2014 I got out of the insurance business and had an opportunity to work with uh, a local outfitter here in the Portland area, Watertime Outfitters, and uh, jumped at that chance and have been there ever since. That's cool. How old are your kids? I have uh, two grown boys, okay. uh, 33 and 31, okay. and um, they live nearby. I've got a few, uh, like I said, about I have four grandchildren, very young, under under three and uh that they're relatively close by so we're able to spend quite a bit of time with them on the weekends and i get to see them so that's i'm i'm living my best life nice and do you are your kids into the outdoor world also do they like <clears throat> fishing yeah both my boys enjoy being in the outdoors and i can get them to join me once in a while on weekends or during the summertime we'll go do some fishing together and and, uh, you know, they're they're obviously busy with a young family and careers and that kind of stuff. But uh, we definitely make time to to get out and uh, enjoy the outdoors. That's good. Yeah. Family time is so important. And I know as anglers, you know, especially guides like I have a good buddy <clears throat> of mine named Brian who guides out at the uh, um, uh, Sacramento Valley area. there, like Truckee, Trinity those rivers up there. And we were just talking briefly the other day about he just got off one of the rivers he was on there for like 20, 24 days, got off for two days. He's up at the Pleasanton show right now. And then he's back out there for 10 days. And I was Ooh. like, Ooh, man, I was like, you're that, grinding. That he's is like, a grind. Yeah. I try yeah. I really tried not to. There are seasons when we are, you know, six days a week um, on the Deschutes, we'll have seasons like that. <clears throat> but generally speaking, um, I'm home on the weekends and uh, spending time with family and, and trying to keep some work-life balance. That's so good. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things that with this podcast starting, like I'm learning to, to have that balance there. And, you know, it's uh, you know, for me personally, it's, you know, it's God first and then my wife comes second. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Good priority. Happy wife, right there. happy, wife happy life. Right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> What sports did your kids play? You said you um, helped coach them. Yeah, I was. Um, I grew up kind of a basketball junkie, and and uh, both my boys were fairly athletic, so I got to coach them in their youth youth years uh, up through um, into high school, and then from there it was just a matter of watching. And uh, but yeah, I really enjoyed that season of my life, and uh, wouldn't trade it for the world. It was a lot of fun. 
That's cool. Yeah, it seems like you definitely have kind of been groomed for the whole guiding industry. I mean, you got the sales background, which helps you relate and deal with people. And the coaching aspect really flows right into the fact of, you know, helping people on the water. Like, I love watching your reels on Instagram, the way that you handle your clients, the way you coach them and, you know, help them, you know, bring the fish in, tell them rod left, rod right. You're just very calm, poised and controlled about it. And I can definitely tell that there's, you know, some coaching that you've had in your past there. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. My mom told me when I was a young man, she said, you should be a coach. Mm -hmm. And I I didn't really grasp totally what that meant. But now that I'm uh, a much, much older and have done it quite a bit, I kind of have a natural bent to, to teach and coach. And that, that comes across uh, in my guiding. It's a good, good combination to have when you can help people, um, whether it's casting or hooking that fish and then working, you know, working it to the point where you get it in the net and be able to celebrate with them. Uh, those are some really gratifying parts of my job and, and, um, blessed enough to be able to have a natural bend at that. So it, it goes well with guiding, especially for steelhead. Yeah, I bet. Um, <clears throat> excuse me with, um, with guiding, you had been fishing. I don't know if I asked you already, but how long, how old were you when you got into fishing, fly fishing? Well, I grew up, um, I grew up in a small town in Southern Oregon called Grants Pass and mm-hmm. I grew up on the Rogue River. So oh. I literally had the river out the back door. So I, um, I started fishing when I was, um, probably eight or nine years old. And, uh, uh, my dad kind of introduced me to fishing one day, picked me up after the, I think I was in third grade and picked me up and took me down to a park on the lower rogue river and caught a steelhead. And that was kind of one of my first exposures to that. And then, um, yeah, when I, by the time I got into being 12, 11, 12 years old, I was on my own down there, uh, in the fall it was a fantastic time to be down on the rogue and, and, um, I used to, I started out fly fishing actually with a spin rod. Oh, so back in the day you had those, and then they're probably still around, but there were those water bobbers where they're clear and they have a stem in the middle of them. And you can pull the stem out and fill some water up in the bobber to create some weight so you can actually cast it. So we would put one of those water bobbers on and then about three feet a liter. And, uh, there were a couple of flies, the old dual dual hook flies uh one was called uh the juicy bug and another one was called the rogue special and i had a schoolmate uh that i would fish with in the afternoons in the fall and we would just go down to the river in this one run and just start our cast short with a bobber and that fly and pretty soon you just kept getting your cast further and further out covering the water across the river and sure enough you'd find these, these rogue steelhead and they would gladly pound one of those flies. So that's kind of how I started fly fishing. And then eventually, uh, when I got in, I think I was like 17, I finally got a hold of my first fly rod and, uh, that didn't look back. I've, I've been kind of addicted to it ever since. What was the first fly rod outfit you got? If you remember, oh, it was, it was like a, a Cortland, gf 1000 it was just a real basic uh nine foot six weight i want to say um matter of fact i think my brother got it for me for a birthday present and uh and then it just from there i just kind of started to develop uh, a real curiosity about it and uh um yeah i just kind of blossomed from there and then eventually years later, many, many years later, got a hold of a spay rod and kind of got my hands on that and fig- started figuring that out. And, uh, I just, I just love, I love all of it, whether it's single hand or two hand, I, I just enjoy them both. Yeah. They're basically their tools and there's a place for everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, for the trout game, it's, it's really hard to beat a single hand rod, but of course, nowadays you've got micro spays for swinging flies for trout and that's a whole nother, uh, level of fishing for trout, but I would say m- most of the time, if I'm fishing for trout, it's a single hand rod. And then, uh, it's just really tough to beat a two handed spay rod to cover water for steelhead, especially if you're, you're swinging flies. That's just uh, such an efficient way, uh, to, to cover water and efficient way to cast and not put a lot of abuse on your body, you know, trying to 
get that line out there with a single hand that that two hand rod just makes it so pleasurable it's really fun yeah that's one of the biggest things that attracted uh, me to it i was uh probably back in 2000 i think five when i was in sacramento i kept seeing um i always call spay casting poetry without words you know it's just it's oh yeah so pretty and i was so intrigued by it and I was like, man, I got to look into this. But at that time, you know, I was probably 24 years old and it was just way too expensive for me to get into it at that time. And then, you know, I got into it, you know, uh, many years later from there. Um, how long have you been in the uh, uh, in the spay game? I was going to say the first time I, I actually got to handle a spay rod was like back in 1990. Um, and that, and that was back when, uh, my, my, I actually had a neighbor that, uh, I built a home here where I live and my neighbor built, moved in, uh, next door and he was actually, uh, from Montana. Oh, cool. And so he, he had a, an extensive background in fly, t fly tying and, and fishing for trout in Montana. And so he wanted to, you know, he was kind of wanting to check out this spay game. So he ended up buying a, a couple of spay rods and it was, I believe it was back when Sage had their, one of their first spay rods and it's like 15 feet long or 14 feet long. And the, and the, the base of it is like the size of a baseball bat. I mean, it's, you know, they're just a, a huge piece of equipment. So that's really when I got an introduction into spay. And then from there, as we know, uh, over time, the, the, the spay rods have, become so much more efficient they're much smaller and lighter and and more powerful and the tapers have changed and and so it's it's been uh it's been really fun to watch and it's been fun to be a part of that evolution of those products you know they just really um have come such a long way since the, you know the, the 90s but uh that's that's when it all started for me that's cool so talk to us about guiding as far as like, what is your, your mindset? Like if people are curious about, Hey, I want to book a trip with Todd. What's kind of the process from start to where you guys get on the water? Um, well, what's really cool, um, is water time outfitters has a, a, a pretty, um, it's actually a pretty awesome website in, in that you can, you can pull that website up and you can see what species of fish we fish for. And then you can actually look at those trips and there's all different, there's day trips, half day trips. There's, you know, we, we've typically in a year fish for, we majority of the time it's steelhead. Uh, we fish for trout on the Deschutes, steelhead on the Deschutes, steelhead locally here in the Portland area, as well as on the North coast in the winter time. And then we also fish for shad, um, which people are go, shad, that's, that's kind of weird, but, um, yeah, the world's largest shad run runs up the Columbia river and, uh, we fish a tributary of the Columbia called the Willamette and we get a fair number of those up there and they readily take a fly. There are just a, a hoot catch. And then we also do some smallmouth bass fishing. So, um, we kind of have a variety of um, offerings as far as what species people really want to target. And, you know, what I what I tell a lot of people is, you know, whether you're a beginner or not, it it, it doesn't really matter because we can cater to whatever your needs are. Um, you know, we have equipment we can provide. Um, so if you're if you're new to it, a lot of times what I do suggest if someone's never done fly fishing before is take a cat, take a class, um, learn, learn, you know, spend, spend, if you're going to spend the money to come and fish with us for a day, save yourself, um, some time up going up that learning curve and take a class, learn how to learn how to cast, uh, learn, learn about the equipment and kind of what, what we use to actually target whatever species it is you want to fish for. And then when you come fishing for that day, it really helps to uh, maximize your time on the water. Um, and, I, and I see this um, probably mo much more because we do it a lot more is with spay casting. And you know, we offer clinics and we, I, I do private lessons and, and all that. And I highly recommend that people take advantage of that. Spend, you know, a hundred and bucks or whatever and and learn take it take a class or a lesson on how to actually cast that rod and that will save you frustration and maximize your time on the water and actually give you the potential to actually hook a fish 
which, you know, everybody wants to do that. Right. That's uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so you said you guys are um, in the Deschutes, you said. And yeah, we have, we have um, uh, a BLM special permit to operate commercially on the, on the Deschutes river. We primarily operate on the lower 100 miles uh, of the Deschutes. Um, for those that aren't familiar with that river, it's uh, uh, probably one of the, the largest river in central Oregon. And it's, and it spans from the central cascades North and dumps into the Columbia. Um, and it has uh, a really world-class trout fishery. It's uh, an amazing place to trout fish. And then it also has uh, steelhead, summer steelhead run. And so we uh, float the river. We do multi-day um, float trips mm -hmm. and then on, on different par parts of it. And then we also have um, a jet boat permit that allows us to use jet boats on the lower 25 miles. And so we will go down, we'll set up a camp um, and we'll um, have, you know, certain groups of people come in and spend two or three days with us. And then they'll go, they'll leave and we'll have another group of people come in and, and, and it's a lot of fun down there. It's a fantastic um, place to relax and uh, enjoy camp, enjoy the river. We usually have uh, some guest chefs that come along with us. So the food can be fantastic. Oh, nice. And then uh, the, the fishing is really um, second to none as far as that goes. And in the Deschutes River, you're not allowed to fish from a boat. So everything is done uh, while wading. And it's not necessarily the easiest river to wade in the world, but um, it's, it's definitely challenging from that perspective, but very rewarding in just all aspects of a, of a fishing trip. When it comes to the challenging part of waiting, just so like if somebody is listening and they're like, oh, shoot, man, I don't think I'm I don't know if I'm a good waiter or not. What would you say um, are the challenges? So that person's like, oh, yeah, I could I could wait that that's in my skill skill set. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, we we highly recommend that people wear spiked felt spiked or spiked waiting boots and then also have a waiting staff. Um, those are just key components in that river. And then we, we also, when we can, you know, cause we have, we have a, a pretty large group of clientele that are, uh, older guys, senior guys that, um, we really try to put them in water. That's not, they're not going to be swimming in. Right. So we tend to try to cater to the skill level or physical ability of a lot of the guys that fish with us. And that range is greatly because we have young guys and we have some older guys. Uh, so we try to try to keep that on, on an even keel. So, um, and then we know the river very well. So we're able to tell people, Hey, this is what this is going to be like. Um, so you want to maintain your waiting line in this area, straight down the river, and that'll keep you from floating a hat. So, um, but yeah, I wouldn't necessarily, say that, oh, you know, I can't wait very well, so I shouldn't fish that river. Um, and, you know, you, knowing your own limitations is really important too, right? So, I mean, if, if you have um, a, some type of a disability where you, you you have a hard time walking on flat ground, I would say then the Deschutes River is probably not the place for you. But, um, you know, if, if, if it's just a matter of um, having a pair of good boots on and a waiting staff, uh, you, there's places we can put you in and have success. That's good. Yeah. Footwear is super important. Um, talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the, the boots you would recommend to somebody. So I, I'm a, uh, Corker's, uh, footwear tester. And so I work pretty closely with the Corker's footwear company here in Portland. And, uh, what's really cool about those boots is, um, they have interchangeable soles. So um, like working on the coast in the wintertime, I work out of a raft, a white water raft that has a fishing frame on it. And I don't want spiked boots in my raft, right? That, that tends to lend to problems, but um, their spiked boots aren't necessarily a requirement on the coastal streams. They tend to be a little bit easier to wade. You have 10 more, more sand and gravel. And, and uh, so it doesn't, doesn't have a lot of lava rock in it. Um, but what's cool is you can interchange those soles, put on felt soles for the winter time. And then when it's time to go to the Deschutes, 
I can slap on a pair of really nice spiked soles and I can adapt to whatever conditions I may be in for that, that particular trip. So I love the flexibility of their product. Um, they're a great group of people to work with. They really care about the angling community and they're, you know, they are, will go out of their way to help you if you have an issue or need, need uh, confirmation, or if you need any kind of help with their products, they're really helpful guys. Nice. Can people purchase those through you and you get, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you're, yeah. If you're on my, my Instagram page, T Retman, um, you can hit the links in my bio and that'll take you right into the Corker's webpage and you can purchase your boots right through my, my Instagram page. Nice. Yeah. I'm just making note here. We'll make sure to get those links in the description so people can find you and uh, awesome. follow along with you on your Instagram. Like I said, I really like your Instagram. Who, who does that? Is that all you or do you have somebody to help you? That's all me. Oh man. Good yeah. job. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had, uh, I've had, um, we have a, a guy uh, that lives out in Idaho. His name is Devin Entz. He's very active on Instagram and he handles all of Watertime Outfitters mm. uh, Instagram feed and just does a fantastic job with that. And so uh, he's been very kind and kind of offering some advice here and there for me and, and uh, it's kind of helped me get started with it a, a few years ago. And, and so I just kind of took some of his tips and tactics and, and uh, just started going with it. So it, it's kind of funny. Um, I never really thought the Instagram thing was for me, it was just more or less kind of proof to my mom that I was working. Um, <laughs> so I, I could show her, Hey, I was, I was on the river working and here's some fish we caught, you know, and it's kind of blossomed into this really kind of a fun, fun project for me. I kind of enjoy it. Um, you know, we're out there in, in really beautiful places and to be able to capture those moments and, and some of the scenery out there is just, to me, it's a, it's like a cherry on top. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's why I kind of got started in kind of uh, recording. And that's why I came about the whole, quote unquote, spay rod adventure name, because I went out and I was like, man, I want pictures of this. And so the pictures and videos became my own personal library. And I was like, well, cool. I want to share these with everybody else that they can get something out of it and learn from my mistakes or learn from my little successes. Then awesome. That's good. Yeah, that's that's fantastic premise right there. So when you guys are out, let's kind of talk a little bit of uh, the the gear you guys are using when you're out there. So okay. you, said you guys will, you know, you guys use a raft. You guys will get out of there, wade there, wade through the run. Um, what kind of rods, reels, and, uh, you know, I know lines are going to depend on um, scenarios, but kind of walk us through a little bit of the equipment you guys are using. Yeah, you know, as, as far as the raft goes, it's primarily used for transportation. We do a little bit of fishing out of the raft. Um, there are some spots here and there where uh, it's too deep to actually wade. So we can actually fish out of the boat on the coast and actually get guys to swing tail outs or swing some of the runs from the boat, which is really, it's actually a lot of fun because they're, you know, you got two guys with you in the boat. It's only about a 13 foot boat. So you're kind of you know, one guy's usually doing it. The other guy in the back's usually cheering them on. So that, that's a, that's kind of a fun way to do it rather than being separated in a big run covering water. Mm -hmm. um, typically guys are using um, anywhere from 11 to 13 foot spay rods, uh, usually seven weights. We do have some guys that use eight weights over there. Um, on the smaller streams, uh, you typically have a lot of trees on the coast, you got trees above you and behind you and across the river from you. And a lot of times those shorter spay rods in that 11 to 12 foot range with a shorter Skagit head. So like a 20 foot Skagit head, mm -hmm. um, really work well to, to get your fly in where you want it and to keep it out of the trees <laughs> because that, that typically is um, one of the bigger challenges when you're spay casting in, in amongst those trees. So that shorter rod, the shorter head, typically we're using uh, in most conditions, you know, in fishable conditions, we're using about a 10 foot section of T11 uh, sink tip. And then um, we use usually I, I'm using about 12 to 15 pound fluorocarbon. You got about a three foot chunk of that on the end of your sink tip. And then uh, we tend to 
depending on the flow of the river and kind of the run we're in, we may use an unweighted fly uh, intruder style pattern, or we may use a weighted fly. Um, just conditions a lot of times in the winter are everything. So being able to cater your presentation to those conditions, a lot of, a lot of times add up to whether you have success or not. Um, one of the lines we've been using a little bit more recently in some of the deeper spots is the, it's the game changer line. It's a, it's a line made by Rio that's, uh, set up with a, um, a multi-sync, um, head on it so it, it's got intermediate a little bit of floating intermediate and then sink and then you attach a, a, a sink tip to the end of that and it really gets mm. the fly down quickly um so you know seven weight rods are common sink tipping is common in the winter time and then also the use of a of a multi-density uh skagit head for those deeper spots that you're trying to cover do you guys um, use uh, mo tips at all? Yeah, 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 absolutely. A lot of those, a lot of those tips that we're putting on uh, those those tungsten T11 tips or T8s or T14s, those are all mo mo tips, real product. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The game changer uh, real line. I've been hearing a lot about that lately. Um, so you guys use about 12, 15, um, pound, what's the length of the leader you guys will use traditionally in like the winter? Yeah, typically I'm, I'm in that two and a half to three foot length of, of that tippet. Um, you know, one thing I will add on the tip on the tippet material is I'm typically using fluorocarbon. Um, yeah, fluorocarbon tends to sink a little faster than a mono product, and then I like my diameters of my fluorocarbon because you can get fluorocarbon in really small diameter and pretty high tensile strength. And I like a little bit more density to my tippet material. A lot of, uh, a lot of times I'm looking for a diameter of uh, 0 0.012 or, or greater. Uh, and, I, and the reason for that is you have a little bit more density to actually turn that fly over mm -hmm. on your cast. So... Um, if you're using a weighted fly, uh, a little bit more density to that fluorocarbon tip, it will help turn that, that fly over. Cause we don't want the fly fouling on, on your leader material, right? You don't have any hook exposed and then you get a grab and there's nothing there to stick it. Right. So, cause your hooks lap, you know, wrapped over your tippet material. So, um, that, that would be one thing I, I, I would kind of pay attention to if you're looking at a setup for, a, you know, your fluorocarbon tippet, I would look at those diameters and that will help you get that fly turned over and make a really nice presentation. That's a good nugget. Yeah. Um, I like that. And then you guys are using intruder flies. Um, are you a big fan of, uh, um, tube flies or do you like traditional flies or do they have a time and place for you? Yeah, I, I use I use some tube flies here and there, especially if we're in a really low water condition um, where I want something really light. Um, I'll go to a tube fly and those those work really well in those scenarios. Um, otherwise, you're typically on a on a shank, you know, a, a steel shank with um, a, a wire uh, set up for your hook. And, and it hangs back behind your feathers and your flash and your, your dubbing or what you might be using to create that, that intruder pattern with. So I, I, I kind of use both depending on again, conditions in this, in the winter time. Yeah. So when you guys are, um, when you guys are in a run, what, what kind of waters are you guys looking for as far as like structure and depth? Great question. Um, you know, I tell people most of the time when you're swinging flies with a spay rod, um, the kind of water you, you're looking for is that water that is, oh, three to six feet, three to seven feet deep, um, walking pace, um, maybe has some structure in it and the, and, and the surface of it looks like a little more orange peel or a little choppy, you know, it's got a little chop to it. Um, that's, that's that you know, prototypical swing water that you're looking for. Um, you know, with that being said, there are some places where 
you may not have, you'll have the depth and you'll have the walking pace, but there may not be much structure in it. And those fish will still be in there. You mm. just have to, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, we want, we want that really good looking water all the time, but sometimes you have to fish water that you know, may not look, you know, as sweet as you would like, but sometimes those, those pieces of water can really pay off. Um, so, but generally speaking, yeah, that's what we're looking for. That's good. Yeah. And then, um, when you guys are trying to target, um, stillhead, if you guys, you know, go through a run and like, let's just say you guys are, you know, using like a, a medium depth, uh, sink tip and you go through the run with a shank fly and you got a certain color on there. If you guys aren't getting a bite or a grab from there, what's kind of the thought process that a the the DIY guy can kind of get from a guide as far as like, okay, I didn't get something through this run. How would a guide approach this to go through it again to maybe increase my chances of grabbing getting a grab? Yeah, you know, and it, it, it to kind of dovetail on that, Paul. A lot of times in the winter time, um, those fish are moving through the river system. So you may go through a run and get nothing, not, not a sniff. And then you might have a cup of coffee and have a snack and go back through it the second time and bingo, you know, or, or it may be a couple times through have some lunch. And then after lunch, you go through again and bam, 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 you hook three. So, you know, that plays a big part of it in the winter time. If you're in a nice piece of water, and you go through it once and, did, and you didn't get a sniff, that doesn't necessarily mean that one, there wasn't any fish in there, or two, there may be fish arriving and working their way through there. So um, that's part of it. And then, you know, to address what you're asking about is a lot of times, um, if, if the conditions allow, I may go to a heavier weighted fly, or I may adjust, um, uh, my lead, my leader length, or I may adjust my color a little bit. Um, a lot of times color and profile of a fly for me is kind of determined by conditions of the water. Can you walk us through that part right there? Yeah. So if, if, um, if I'm fishing on a day where the water may be a little bit cloudy, still got a green tint to it, still has a real nice color, but it's kind of milky, maybe even a little tingy. Mm -hmm. I might move to a little bit bigger profile on my fly and okay. maybe even a little bit brighter color on my fly, you know, whereas if you take the opposite of that and the water's lower and really clear, I'll move my profile down smaller and I'll move to a darker pattern, like even black, you know, maybe a little bit of flash on it and some black and a little marabou or maybe some rabbit strip. Um, and just kind of uh, cater what I'm presenting to the conditions and what the conditions allow. So um, to me, you know, conditions are kind of, that's, that's what I'm looking at first. If I know the water is good depth, good pace. Yeah. There's got, this looks fishy, but it's colored up. I'm just going to adjust my pattern. That's good. And you just reminded me of something else when you talked about conditions um, obviously, like you said, you're out on the water five, six days a week from there. So you know the patterns of everything that's going on, but, um, what are kind of some things you look for as far as like, do you go as in depth as like, okay, the flow is this on this day. And now it's going to be this flow on that day. This is what the moon is. This is what the pressure is. This is what the temperature is. Do you kind of take all that and articulate a plan? You're, you're muted. Oh. There you go. You were muted. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Hold on one sec. Let me wait 10 seconds. So there's a long pause and then I'll know to edit that out. So bear with me one sec. Okay. Okay. We're good. Um, so if I understood your, your question is, is like, you know, um, and I'll, I would say this, so if we're on the river, you know, we're over there for five days and, and, and usually the conditions change day by day. Right. 
So I may come to a run one day and it'll fish a certain way. And I'm going to fish it with a certain sink tip. I'm going to fish it with a certain size fly or way to fly. And then two days later, we come to that same run. Hey guys, we need to move our sink tip down to a T8 and we need to go with a lighter fly through here. We're going to be hanging up. So yeah, again, um, those conditions change a lot on from just a flow perspective that, that we have to make adjustments to. But we also pay attention to, um, you mentioned moon or tide or those yeah. kind of things. Um, we're usually tuned in, especially on the North Coast. Um, we're tuned into what the tides are doing. You know, are these big tides? Are the bars really super rough? You know, um, a lot of times those fish don't like to come over a really rough bar. So sometimes, you know, and there's not much we can do about that other than just being aware of it. Uh, but on those tide affected rivers, those coastal streams, you can sometimes know that, hey, we had some big tides the last several days and you got some good water conditions. We need to be ready. I mean, there's going to be fish in the system. We need to make sure we're putting ourselves in the best place possible with with the right setup to uh, to try and get uh, a high level of success. Yeah. And then um, obviously coastal rivers, you know, says it in its name, coastal rivers, you got to look at the tides and everything. I've always been curious how many miles away from the ocean or the sound would you say that you're kind of outside of that um, realm where the tides will affect the fishing from there? Yeah, I would say, you know, if you're in the lower five miles of a stream, um, yeah, you're going to, you know, most of the time, my experience has been if you're in the lower five miles and those tides are are big and, and you got the right conditions, there's probably going to be fresh fish moving through there. Whereas if you're up mile uh, up 20 miles, 25 miles, you're not necessarily going to see that direct correlation. A lot of times in the coastal streams on the lower ends, you don't have a ton of gradient. You don't have a lot of obstructions or rapids or falls, right? A lot of that, a lot of that's kind of more coastal tidal type uh, topography. Whereas you move up the drainage aways and now you've got white water and you've got drops and you've got gradient and now those fish will slow down. So um, it's a little bit different up there than it is down on the, on uh, lower on the, on the drainage. So yeah, you'll, you'll see a difference for sure. That's good. Yeah. I was always wondering about that. So yeah, we got the line set up. Um, we got the rods, um, you know, sink tips, flies. Um, what kind of reels do you recommend people to, um, you know, or what, do you, what reels do you guys use out there? Yeah. You know, um, and, and with rods too, I, I tell people, you know, nowadays there's so many good rods on the market. I mean, in, in all different price points there, the, the technology is so good that, you don't have to spend a ton of money to get a good rod. Uh, you just don't. And I would say on the real side of that, uh, it's fairly similar. I, you know, obviously uh, for steelhead and bigger game fish, it's really important that that reel have a, a good smooth drag. Um, <clears throat> nothing more frustrating than having uh, hooking a fish and having it, you know, spool out your, your reel and get all wadded up and you snap off a fish because your reels drag didn't work correctly. Um, so I tell people, I say, you know, um, yeah, get a good rod, but get a good reel too, you know, and I would say across the board, there's all kinds of manufacturers that make really good reels, you know, Reddington and Sage and Orbis and, uh, Lamson and Hatch. And, you know, just, there's just lots of Abel's and, there's lots of good reels out there. Um, but I, I would say, you know, don't, don't necessarily skimp on your reel because when you've got that chrome bright, hot steelhead ripping line off your reel, you want that drag to perform. And, and those, those types of things with having a reel mess up or fail can be the difference between catching it and, and not. Yeah, that would be very, uh, That'd be a hard pill to swallow, knowing your gear kind of, you ch you tensed out on it only to find out, you know, oh, shoot. It's like you always hear people, better check your leaders. If you got knots in it, you're going to regret it. And I'm so guilty of that. I'm like, 
ah, okay, it's only going to take that one time and I'm going to be like, Oh, everybody was right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had guys that knew they had knots in their leader and lost fish, you know, so keeping the leader fresh, not free. Um, you know, and I tell people a lot of times, um, you, you, you spent, you know, $500 on that reel, let it do it, let it do its job, you know, don't have your hands on the line and holding the line and all that. Yeah. Like as far as like palming the reel. Yeah, that's just, I, you know, that's kind of a no, no in my book. I mean, we're going to set that, we're going to set that drag up at a correct level so that it's, it's not going to spin up on you if the, if the fish runs and it's not going to be so hard that the fish can't take it off. You know, you got to have that, that setting correct so that you get the most out of that reel and allow it to do the work for you. Yeah. I've oft, I've often wondered this, um, you know, I feel like everybody has a different opinion on their, their drags. Like I know some people that they just have their drags completely loose. And then there's other people that have their drags, you know, like you're saying, I'm in the same boat you are. I want that drag to be in a happy medium to where if the fish takes off, he's not going to spool up my reel, but I want it strong enough to where it gives them some resistance. And I've just, I've never understood why people have their drag so loose because I remember asking some buddies out at the river, you know, they get done, you know, throwing out a cast and then you get that nice burp off the line, right? It takes some line off. It's like, yeah. Oh, good cast, man. You know, you always put some power in that. And he's like, no man, my reels like set to nothing. And again, I'm still relatively new to the game. And I was like, I don't understand why you would want the reel so loose. That's the whole point of the reel is to give resistance to the fish there. A little bit. Yeah. You know, that's it, those guys will probably learn that lesson the hard way if they get <laughs> a really hot fish when it absolutely just turns and goes real quick and then spools their reel up on them. Um, but yeah, that that tension is a happy medium. I, I like to say if I can yank on that line and and it doesn't spool up the reel, hmm. that's that's a good setting. So it's it's loose enough that it will come off but not so much that if you yank on it, it overruns. So you can test that every time and set it accordingly before you start fishing. And some of the reels have numbers on their dials. Like I, I use this, a Sage Spay reel and it's got numbers on the, on the dial. So I actually know, ah, I want mine set at about a three and a half. And, and that's worked really well for me. So whatever manufacturer that it is, a lot of the times they'll have markings on them that you can set and then you're ready to go. Yeah, that's good. And I was, I was just thinking about this right now is that if like I have a Lampson reel and it doesn't have the, uh, the numbers on it, but what one could do is you could basically use like a clock formation. You could have like a 12 o'clock line and you know, where that would be like kind of the start of it. And then you could take your dial to a certain spot and kind of like mark that and know that, Hey, in between this spot and this spot is where I like it. Like use some nail polish or something like that. Yeah. That way you have some type of dial. Yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. And then you can always double check it. Like I said, you can pull on it, give it a yank and see what happens. And then, you know, Hey, I'm ready to go. My, 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 uh, my, set, I got my drag set correctly. I'm ready to fish. That's good. Yeah. Um, so once we've hooked up with the fish, talk to us about how to handle that big guy. <laughs> uh, a lot, a lot of times, um, you know, when you're swinging a fly and uh, most, most people's most newer anglers air is they get that initial bump or an initial grab and, and they try and trout set. Oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, in, in the, in the spay game, swinging flies for steelhead, you're looking for commitment with what I tell people is wait until you feel the weight of the fish. Okay. So you may, you know, steelhead bite differently. I, I kind of classify them in a couple of different categories. Uh, you've got the one that does the peck, 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 and then finally, gets a hold of that fly and turns. And that's when you feel that rod load up. Right. And then you got the one that does the grab and go. I mean, where it's like, Whoa! 
and it's 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 on you know there was just no question about that that's actually my favorite because then it's really hard to screw that up because they they just <laughs> ripping the fly downstream and you're real screaming and but if you can maintain uh composure a lot of times i i tell people just to repeat to yourself just let it happen just mm. just let it happen and once that weight occurs and you're feeling that tug and that weight then raise that rod tip up and to the bank that you're standing on. Okay. Not, not directly upstream or, you know, but, but more of a sweeping motion up a nice vertical rod tip, get that parabolic bend in that rod so that it's doing its job. And then anything beyond that, that reel starts to take over and really do the work for you. If that fish is running, um, and then the other thing is, if possible, if that fish is downstream, I like to move downstream and try to get parallel with that fish. I call squaring up. Let's get down and square up with the fish so that that line is directly across from its jaw and we're not pulling that hook upstream like out of its mouth. And sometimes these fish are so hot, they may come upstream and be right across from you or they may go upstream past you. Or they may go like they're going to the ocean. You just, you have to be prepared to make moves if possible. There's some places where you hook fish where you really have nowhere to go. You can't wait any further down. You're going to be in this big hole. Uh, so, but generally speaking, that's kind of my, that's kind of my song and dance, so to speak. When I, when I've got a client that hooks a fish, you know, sweep that rod up to that near bank, get a nice high rod tip, get a good parabolic bend, let that reel work for you. And then let's move downstream and try to square up with it if we can and really have the battle take place from that angle. That's good. So you basically want the line, the the fly line in line with the fish there. Is yeah, per perpendicular to the river, essentially. Yeah. Okay. And then... um. Uh, as far as netting goes, like I've always heard, you know, you want to net the fish, you know, head first. D does that really matter? What yeah. You know, uh, typically I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm usually on the downstream of downstream side of my client. Yep. Um, and then I typically position myself once that steel head is getting to that, that point of where it's tiring, when its head will usually come up mm. when it's tiring now, we don't want to exhaust the fish to the point where it can't recover, right? We want right. to try to land it in a very responsible way so that it's got energy to recover and, and move along its its journey. So I put I kind of post up downstream of my client, just, just downstream about a rod's length away from them. And then as that fish starts to tire and that head comes up a little bit, I'll have them lift the rod reel down, lift the rod up right over the top of my head. And a lot of times that'll swing that head right toward me and just scoop them up. Um, that's, that's worked well for me. Um, uh, if I find myself on the upstream side, it's you're on the wrong side. Cause typically that fish is going to be on the downstream side of your client as it tires. Yeah. Yeah. And then you kind of mentioned it as far as fish handling goes, talk to us a little bit about, you know, proper etiquette and, um, safe handling on a fish. Yeah. You know, um, Obviously, we have a lot of a lot of folks that that like to catch hatchery fish, and you know, if if the fish is in great shape and they want to harvest it, that's what it's there for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, safe handling is kind of out the window. You get it in the net, you know, be be a humane, whack it, and put yeah. it out of its misery, and 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 then you know, go about cleaning and preparing it. But um, a lot of the fish this time of year, you know, we're getting into that time of the year where most of those streams are going to have wild stock. And those, those fish are special. They are amazing creatures. And so, you know, like I said, not over exhausting the fish, let's get it in the net. You know, I like to put the steelhead on its side. That'll typically keep it from freaking out. I'm usually in deep enough water where if it is splashing or thrashing about, it's not going to hit its head on a rock. Right. So I'm not, I'm not dragging the fish up on the bank. We're netting the fish out in deep enough water to where it's not going to harm itself. Um, and then a lot of times grabbing that fly by the wrist, right back by its tail and rotating it on its side, it'll kind of, it will calm down. Mm. And then you can, you know, get, get a couple pictures or little video, um, and then lower that net back down, turn that fish right side up. So it kind of gets its bearings. 
And then I like to have it water flowing into the mouth and the face of the fish and allow it to recover, allow, you know, and some of these wild fish, it doesn't take very long and mm. they're just, whoop, they're, they're gone. Um, sometimes it might take a little bit longer, hold on to them, support them on the, on the front, support their tail and support their head and just kind of keep them into that water coming downstream and you'll see their mouth and their gills working. And then pretty soon they'll get a little bit of a wiggle and they're gone. And, and that's, that's just, that's just a beautiful thing. That's a good visual cue that you said, you know, look at their mouth and look at their gills, you know, and then you'll kind of have an idea of when they're they're you know getting ready to kick off because there's been times where you know i haven't hooked up with many fish by any means but the handful i have you know you'll sit there in the river with them and then you're like all right buddy we'll start moving and you start seeing their mouth moving their gills and you're like all right well it's time for you to kick off and you just kind of you know very gently give them an up and down and calm water and then they they kick off from there yeah yeah, sometimes you got to be careful if you're in some sandy sediment, uh, try to move out to where you're not in that, move into some clean flowing water so it's nice and clean, it's not dirty, and they're not ingesting that into their gills. And then that usually allows them to recover fairly quickly. And, you know, like I said, a, a lot of these these wild fish, they recover actually really fast and then boom, they're gone. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and then... um I guess that's that's the end of the trip there. I mean, once you guys have caught fish, you know, you guys get back and you guys are just basically uh, floating back down to the takeout point from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, usually um, we usually like to have a little lunch out on the river. We'll usually take in the wintertime. We're usually having a little bit of hot soup and some bread and um, chips, apples, nuts, just some good, you know, good energy food. Warm you up a little bit from the inside out. Um, usually hit a few runs after lunch and then we head to the takeout, head back to the lodge and then, uh, you know, get near the fire to warm up this time of year. Cause it's so, you know, being out in the elements this time of year, um, especially if you're soaking the guys pretty good, they're in runs up to their hips, you know, and that tends to, not only do you need to layer up really well if you're fishing in those conditions, but, uh, um, you know, getting back at the end of the day, getting some hot liquids in you and getting near the fire and taking that chill off, getting a good night's rest, set yourself up for success on the next day for sure. Yeah. So do you guide out of the lodge? For, yeah. For, okay. Yep. What's the lodge company name? On the North coast, we, we have a place that we rent. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a house gentleman that's been a client of ours um, allows us to, to rent that from him for the winter time. And so we can host four guys at a time. So we have groups of four that come in. Um, and we host anywhere from two to four days at a time, depending on the group. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we have a place to operate out of. It's nice that we can go back at the end of the day and I'll have a meal together and tell stories and swap pictures. And, uh, it's really, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of really good clients and a lot of fun guys that, that we enjoy hanging out with. And, uh, it just makes the job that much more pleasurable. Yeah, that's, that's super cool. The the part where you get to um, build relationships with people, you know, I mean, I think is especially guys, right. We're so, we're so goal oriented to where it's like, I just want to catch a fish. But then once you can slow down and you all get to kind of fellowship at the end of the night and, you know, talk about what it is you did. And remember when you did that, man, you almost fell down and you're eating food and whatever it is from there. It's a, it's a great time to build connections with people and, you've probably found this out as a guide and I've found this out just by taking a handful of people out on the raft with me is that as guys, we always have like our armor up, right? We're always protecting ourselves just in life. And then when we get out there, we kind of let it all down and we start opening up about life in general. And you start to really get to connect with these guys that you maybe wouldn't get to connect with on a personal level, just because we don't feel comfortable in the everyday environments from there. And I'm sure. Yeah. You so, it, so true, Paul. And, and I'm, I'm an introvert. So, you know, it, oh, uh, okay. I'm not really an extroverted guy. So, you know, to, to be out there and, and build relationships with, with the clients that we have, we have a really um, a large contingent of guys that fish with us multiple times a year, year after year. And, and it's really, 
it, it becomes you're you're not really fishing with clients, you're fishing with your friends. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these are guys that we've we've built these relationships with over the years. And and we we reminisce on funny stories that we've all been part of, whether you know, we, we were fell down and we're swimming, or you know, remember the big fish you caught in that one run and go back and pull the picture up and laugh about it. And you know it's, it's really makes the job uh, a lot of fun. You know, it's, and we still have a job to do, you know, we still got to get people down the river safely and have fun out there and, and all that. But the relationships that you build with these guys, because let's face it, you, you know, I, I use a, I kind of coin a phrase when it comes to spay fishing for steelhead, we're out there chasing unicorns with sticks, strings, and feathers. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge, you know, we're taking what's challenging and make it difficult right it's already difficult enough and we're doing it with swinging flies for them so uh, a lot of the guys that fish with us enjoy that process and and that's you know they enjoy the casting they enjoy the grind and and being out in the elements and that's all part of that relationship building you know because we all know hey this is not the easiest thing to do but we're out here doing it anyway, whether it's 21 degrees or whether it's 85 degrees in the summertime on the, on the shoots, you know, so being able to have a place to go at the end of the day and recap and, and laugh and, and have a good time, whether that's in the lodge in the wintertime or whether it's around a campfire on the shoots, you know, in the summertime, uh, it's those, those are special times. And that's what keeps a lot of guys coming back. You know, they, they want to come back and get outdoors and let their hair down a little bit because you're right. If if we knew those guys in town or if we met, you know, saw them somewhere else in the public, we probably wouldn't be having conversations. Um, so, yeah, you're spot on there, Paul. Yeah. Um, tell me something that is how fly fishing or just the outdoors is kind of um, kind of helped you with life. Like you kind of talked about, you know, like people that do spay fish, they they embrace the grind. They invade they they. Um, they embrace the challenge from there. What are what are some things that you've learned from fishing that have helped you in everyday life situations? Well, I've I've always been I've always kind of just naturally been an outdoors person. I I tend to thrive in the outdoors. I I, I kind of look at it as the outdoors for me is life giving, not mm. not life sucking. <laughs> and and I worked in an office for twenty five years, you know. Um, so the outdoors were, was my escape. It was my um, sacred romance, if you will. It was one of those places where it recharged my batteries. Um, you know, being around, uh, working with people, not that I didn't like that, but working with people or around people constantly every day can be draining the battery. For some people, that's increasing the battery. That's giving them more juice to go. They just got to be around people. And I naturally wasn't that way. So, now that I'm able to work outdoors and work with people, it's really a great balance for me. So, you know, it's, it's life giving work and, uh, um, you know, hopefully that comes across in the way that I do my job and, and, and relate with people and, and, and have fun with people out there. That's good. Yeah. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, we'll, we'll end with this question here. Um, talk to us a little bit about spay casting. I know it's such a big topic, but as far as just the perspective as the newest person getting in, like you alluded to practicing from there. Yeah, I, I try to break down the spay cast into three steps and there's nuances between each one of these steps. But at, at, if you're getting into spay casting, there's certain like any skill you learn, there's terminology, right? So you have the anchor right? Placing our anchor when we're getting ready to set up our cast, you have the creation of the D loop. Okay. And then you have the actual stroke or the actual cast itself. So I, I, I try to break it down into three fairly digestible st uh, steps. And when I run a course or a clinic or a private lesson, I start with the foundation and the foundation is setting the anchor. What's a good anchor? What does that mean? What's that look like? What's it take to do that and be consistent with that anchor? Whether it's, you know, there's a couple of different types of casts you can do, C spays, snap tees, double spay, single spay. So I'm usually teaching people to do a double spay and then I'm teaching them to do a C spay. I'm trying to give them two, two things in their casting toolbox, if you will, 
so that they're able to fish from both sides of the river. So setting that anchor is the foundation to a good cast. So if we can learn what that foundation looks like and how to do it consistently, then we're going to create step two much better, which is the D loop. And that's really the turbocharger of your cast. And getting that D loop to fill up behind you into that, that vertical position of that rod tip and having that in firing position, a correct firing position, filling that D loop up and then making that cast, that actual stroke, that third step and making that D loop then compress into a nice tight loop, create a lot of line speed and generates that really nice tight cast that turns that fly over and actually sets you up so that you can actually fish. So by completing those three steps and understanding the nuances between each one of those steps, that really allows people to not only enjoy the cast, but then enjoy the fishing process and actually be able to fish more effectively and more efficiently. Because when you do that correctly, it makes it a lot of fun. It makes it a lot of fun. That's good. Yeah, that, that's super helpful. Is there any um, video that you know of or you would recommend on YouTube where people can kind of get a more in-depth understanding of anchor placement? Um, I'm sure there's lots of material. <laughs> I've, that's a little bit of a double-edged sword because pe I have people that have shown up. Yeah, I saw it on YouTube. And then you see what they what they think they saw. And it's like, uh, that's true. Yeah. I, you know, so I, 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 I don't. I, okay. I don't have a place that you could go to. You know, um, I've picked up some really good stuff from some really good high level casters, Simon Gosworth, yeah. Deck Hogan. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with Deck a few times on some casting clinics and help out. And, and that guy is really good at what he does. And I, if you can find him on YouTube or maybe Simon Gosworth on, on YouTube, um, those are, those are two good guys, two good resources to maybe pick up some good basic information or fundamentals and, and, every guy is going to teach a little bit differently. They're going to use a little bit different analogies, you know, but um, I've learned quite a bit from those guys over the years and uh, been able to kind of like, I would teach it differently than they would. Right. That doesn't mean it's bad. It's just different. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, the whole YouTube thing, I would say is, is kind of a double-edged sword, but I, those would be my two guys that I would say, Hey, if you can take a look at some of their stuff and, and, uh, and, and they may be real helpful and, and click some things mentally for you that you were like, Oh, okay. Now I know what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I remember back in, uh, like 2005, 2006 is when I first saw it, but it was the, um, spake, uh, spade casting real video that, um, Simon did with George Cook and, uh, Ed Ward and, yeah. There was yeah. one more person, but the the thing I'm like, I'm very visual and I can get very an analytical sometimes where I have to get out of my head, but the, the bio, the, the biometrics part that they had of the stick figures that were all electronically and it was showing the path of the rod and everything that was super valuable to me. And I just rewatched that video, a uh, local fly shop here will let you um, rent videos. And, oh, cool. Uh, I, I rewatched it and I was like, yeah, man, like just the whole part where Simon talks about like the railroad tracks and yeah. you know, your anchor. It just, I picked up a couple of bad habits, but I'm working on it now with a buddy of mine, Dave Flaherty, who does um, online um, uh, casting lessons from there, which oh, has cool. been a big help for me because I had all these different sync tips from what people were telling me. And he's like, let's just start you back at the right foundation. Let's get you some T11 you know, 10 foot from there and we'll know whatever kinks you have in there. I can work with you from there. And I was like, man, you're the coach. You tell me how high, you tell me to jump. I'm going to say how high. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome. And I would say George Cook's another good guy to, to, to see if you can find some, some things on YouTube on him. He's, he's an excellent instructor for sure. He is. Yeah. He, um, he taught me, um, at the last spade clay, he was out two years ago on the, uh, Snoqualmie river, I asked him, I was like, hey, how do I get my loops from big to small? And he's like, the number one thing about getting your smaller loops is you want to pull that bottom hand into your stomach. I was like, okay. <laughs> I love that guy. Yep. He's so cool. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, one of the catchphrases I'll use when teaching is, um, 
And I got this from a guy who was on a trip with us, who is actually at the time was the uh, presiding president of the Golden Gate uh, Casting Club down in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And one of his phrases was, you know, the butt of the rod, the butt of the rod, butt to the gut. So mm -hmm. that, that was the term he used for making that stroke butt to the gut. And so I use that a lot of times and that's, that really clicks with people too. That's a good visual to use that lower hand. The combination of using that lower hand and stopping that rod tip high is what will compress that loop and really drive that good line speed you're looking for. Yeah, that's good. Well, like I said, I want to be respectful of your time, but before I let you go, um, is there anything that you wanted to share that we maybe didn't get to? No, I think, I think we got quite a bit covered. Um, you know, the main thing is just, um, is get out there, you know, uh, get out there, get your fly wet, you know, it, take a class. If you're, if you're interested in the, in this, the whole spay casting world, uh, like you said, there's lots of information on YouTube, but there's really no better, better way than to go take a class and get one in your hand and have someone explain to you kind of how that it's a great tool, uh, yeah. fantastic tool. And it's a lot of fun to use. And I would just say, you know, get on the water. Yeah. Well, before, um, I let you go, do you want to, um, let people know where they can find you and, um, sure. other yeah they can yeah work. yeah they can find me on on instagram at t retman or todd retman you can you can look it up that way um you can find me at uh watertimeoutfitters.com our website and uh, those are the two best places to inquire um probably uh finding me on instagram i'll, I'll you know more message response on that piece of it and then the uh the website um, lots of information about trips there and what we offer uh, our menu of offerings for people that want to fly fish. Yeah. Those are the two best spots. Nice. Well, Todd, don't go anywhere. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. And then uh, you and I will say goodbye to each other. All so, right, guys and gals. I hope you uh, learned a lot there. You can tell Scott's got a lot or Scott, I'm sorry, Todd, <laughs> singing <laughs> Scott up in uh, the confluence shop there in Bellingham <laughs> that uh, Todd has a lot of information there as far as still heading. So, uh, yeah, just look him up, see if, um, you know, he's in your area, book a trip with them, get out there on the water and, um, till next time, you know, be safe and, uh, make it a great day. We'll see you all next time.